to learn today. And um, I'm excited for NKA. I've been a member for several years here in the Boise area. And I was excited to read in the uh, in AARP bulletin uh, for March uh, under the state of Idaho uh, about the New Knowledge Adventures program. And um, what it says is that it has absolutely increased our learning abilities. Uh, the pandemic didn't slow us down because it's proved uh, that we can still have enriching opportunities virtually. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity and grateful that Sheena, uh, kudos to you for setting this up and we'll see us through safely. And also to our uh, presenter. Uh, before I introduce her, there's just a couple of little things. Uh, as you know, remember in the other NKA programs, we would always have something to fill out at the end, a questionnaire. And that will not be the case this time. Also, um, Dr. Bargan has said that if you have questions, um, please type them in in the chat and then we'll uh, deal with them at that time um, that you type them in. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Bargan because she can tell us about her background and what we can expect today. So um, take it away, Dr. Bargan. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. And there are actually two of us um, that will be presenting today. I will get us started um, and then Tally um, will finish us up and then we'll both be able to answer questions um, as we're going or at the end as well. We should have plenty of time at the end, I hope. I shouldn't have said that out loud. Now we'll be running. <laughs> um, so my name is um, Gabriel Bargan. I go by Gabe and I am an associate professor of audiology at Idaho State University. Um, I reside on the Meridian campus. Um, so I don't get a I don't get to go to Pocatello too much and I have not gone there at all um, in the last year or so, but um, I, the Idaho State University programs um, on the Meridian campus are definitely growing and um, we're expanding um, every year. So um, my, so as a side note, um, my I, specialty is definitely pediatrics. So um, I'm, I'm more biased to the little ears, uh, but um, the good thing is when we are born, um, our ear uh, for the inside part of it, it's already fully grown. So um, nothing really changes with that ear on the inside um, for when you're born um, to as you age, except unfortunately we sometimes lose our hearing. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and then I will briefly introduce Tally. And then if you have anything else to add, Tally, feel free. Um, Tally Roadman is one of our amazing PhD students um, in the Rehabilitation and Communication Sciences program. And I am blessed to have her as one of my students. And so um, she is going to uh, help with this presentation today. So Tally, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, just to thank you for the lovely presentation of me and just to say that I'm coming from Israel, so sorry for my accent. Everybody, I hope you can adjust it rapidly. We'll meet again <laughs> in, the, in the... All right, so I will get us started. And um, as Carol indicated, if you do have questions, feel free to type those into the chat. Um, we you know, hearing is a very broad category. And so we might not touch on everything that you have that um, you have questions on. So feel free to um, put those in the chat. If they have to do with what we're talking about, we'll probably address them as they're asked. Um, if, it's, if it's way off topic of what we're talking about, I might save it to the end. Um, so then we can bring it back in. Sound good? All right, let's get started then. Okay, well, I already did this, so we can skip the slide. Alrighty, so we're gonna try to, um, I want to introduce the auditory system. Um, so our hearing um, system, just talking about the different parts and um, where problems can occur in that system. We'll talk about presbycusis, or that's the fancy way of saying hearing loss as we get older. Uh, we're gonna talk about that connection between hearing and then our ability to, um, to think that cognitive uh, portion. So um, that really is what we're gonna spend probably the majority of time on today that um, and Tally's gonna share that with us. And then we're gonna talk about the consequences of if you do have a hearing loss, um, what happens if you don't pay attention to that? What, what happens when you don't treat it? And then we'll talk about a few treatments for hearing loss. 
And then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for questions and answers um, for things that we didn't answer during our presentation. So let's get started with our auditory system. So the part that we see is the pinna, right? We get to we get to see that the outer part. Um, we get to rest our glasses on it. We get to put some earrings on it sometimes. Um, but that part really doesn't do a whole lot. That's the outer ear. Um, I, the fancy word for that would be the pinna. Um, we have our ear canal, and then we have a little thin membrane or thin skin um, that's the eardrum, and then. Beyond that eardrum, we have the middle ear. That's where the bones are within our um, hearing system. Um, and essentially what happens is our, the outer ear will collect that sound. It will send it down the ear canal. It will hit that eardrum. And then it will send that energy through those bones. Um, they're also known as the ossicles. You might've learned them as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, right, in school. Um, so that sound will, the energy will travel through those bones. And then there's a little, um, the, the stirrup part of those bones is going to be pushing um, on the inner ear. And that inner ear, you can see right here, that's called the cochlea. That's really where the hearing occurs. So essentially that energy goes into the cochlea and then the cochlea is connected to the nerves. So it changes that energy into an electrical impulse and then it travels up. Um, through that auditory pathway into the brain. And so our ear does a great job of collecting that sound, of changing it into an electrical form that our brain can understand. And then once it gets to our brain, our brain adds important information to it, right? It says, ooh, that sound is my dog barking. I better go let her out um, so I don't have to clean up after her, right? Um, so we have to have our ear to collect that sound, but we really have to have our brain to make sense of it. Our brain is really what does a lot of our hearing um, and it's important uh, part of that auditory system. Now we can have breakdowns at all parts of this system. Um, so the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. And then also beyond that, the neural portion or the, the connections right to the brain can have breakdowns. Um, just before we got started, there was a question about earwax. Earwax can cause hearing loss. If you have too much earwax that gets built up um, in that canal area, it can essentially stop the sound right from going in. Um, so that needs to be taken care of once in a while. And I always tell my patients, Earwax is normal. It's okay. Don't be embarrassed by your earwax. We all have it. Um, sometimes you just produce too much of it. And so it has to be removed sometimes. Um, beyond that, the middle ear. Um, has anyone ever experienced an ear infection? I know I have. I think that's how I got into this profession. Um, but um, usually that happens most often with kiddos, right? Um, with the, our young kiddos, they experience um, middle ear infections. But um, they can persist into adulthood as well. Um, my father actually experienced um, a lot of ear infections in his um, 60s, and he had to get ear tubes put in in order to drain that fluid. And then once it was done, then it was gone. But um, for some reason, he just had a bout of it. Um, beyond that, um, in the cochlea, um, if there's damage that occurs in that cochlea, that's our sensory um, organ, essentially, for the hearing. And so if there is damage within the cochlea, you might've heard of hair cells. Um, so there are hair cells within that cochlea. And if they are damaged, they typically cannot be fixed. Um, that is what's going to cause permanent hearing loss. So hearing loss that happens within the cochlea is referred to as sensory neural hearing loss. Hearing loss that I talked about previously, so in that middle ear or the outer ear, that's referred to as conductive hearing loss. So if you've gone to the doctor and they indicated that, that's, that's just the indication between the, the different types of hearing loss. Usually conductive hearing loss, there's something medical that we can do um, to, to alleviate that, to fix it. Um, but in the, with sensory neural hearing loss, that's usually not fixable. Um, you're gonna have a permanent hearing loss that needs to have some oral rehabilitation in order to, to, get, to fix it or to um, hear better. Um, additionally, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but um, these pathways in the brain, they can also be affected. Um, so if damage occurs in that auditory pathway leading up to the brain, um, then you can have a hearing loss as well. Uh, sometimes those pathways will be hurt um, or injured uh, by a stroke 
or um, if any, somebody has maybe a traumatic brain injury, so a car accident, um, those kind of things can happen. Um, multiple sclerosis. So those kind of um, injuries or conditions can cause um, problem to that auditory pathway. And again, typically that is going to be a permanent hearing loss. And so a different type of intervention, it might be hearing aids, um, it might be something else, um, maybe just therapy um, to try to build up those um, pathways again. Um, that can occur to try to, to help um, with that type of hearing loss. All right, any questions about that before we move on? Because I want you guys to, to understand how your body's working before we move. Okay. Um, oh, I, I should have practiced these before because here it is. So we already talked about the conductive hearing loss that's in that outer or middle ear the sensory neural hearing loss, that's in that middle, the cochlea. I didn't mention mix, so I'm glad I had this on the slide. So you can have hearing loss in all of those parts or a couple of those parts. So you could potentially have a conductive hearing loss at the same time as a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, so maybe you have wax buildup and you have damage in the cochlea. Um, so you could have both of those types of hearing loss at the same time. All right, so speaking of hearing loss, um, if you've ever had a hearing test done, you might have seen a tool or a, a, a graph that looks like this. And this is a way for um, audiology professionals to indicate, to kind of write down what's going on with your hearing. Um, the way that we measure hearing is by using decibels. Um, so how loud or soft, um, what pitch is that sound that's coming in? Um, so on this graph, um, on the the horizontal axis, right? Um, we're looking at um, how uh, low or high the pitch of that sound. So we start with very low pitches going up to very high pitches. Um, I like to think of this as a piano. Um, so in the piano, and if you're sitting down, right, your left hand is at those low keys and then your right hand is at the high keys. Very similar to this, um, what this graph is showing. If we look at the vertical axis, this is talking about the loudness. Um, so how soft or loud is that sound? So it starts up here at the top, it's very soft, and then it goes all the way um, to extremely loud. So the interesting thing here you'll notice, I don't know, hopefully you can see it, um, but here's our zero, and then we have negative 10. So hearing doesn't actually stop at zero. It is, it's a, um, it's a variant. That zero is kind of considered the, the absolute normal but you can have better than zero um, hearing. Um, not a lot of people do, but you can. So, so that zero is the average normal hearing. So if we think about what, what is that average um, or the range, we actually have a fairly large normal range of hearing. Um, it goes up to 20. So when we're measuring hearing and if we have to turn it up to that 20 um, dB of sound, um, and you're still able to hear it, then we would, we would say, well, your, your hearing is essentially normal. Now, if we have to turn it up more um, to get you to hear those sounds, then we would indicate that there's a hearing loss present. Um, and these terms, mild, moderate, moderately severe, um, that's really just a way for us to categorize them. Um, just, just because we categorize the hearing loss as a mild hearing loss, doesn't mean that it, will, it, it doesn't significantly impact your life even a mild hearing loss um, is gonna give you trouble, um, especially if you're in a loud, uh, like a lot of background noise. Um, I think of uh, going out to eat at a restaurant and um, even if you have a mild hearing loss, that's gonna impact your ability to understand what somebody's saying. You can hear that they're talking, right? You, can, you know that they're saying something, but it's not clear because you're not getting all the little parts of speech because they're being drowned out by that background noise. Um, so if you have uh, these different degrees of hearing loss, usually up to um, moderate, sometimes even moderately severe, we can, um, hearing aids will usually be pretty beneficial um, to you. Uh, technology that we have right now is, is pretty amazing with hearing aids and it improves almost yearly. Um, and Tally's gonna talk a little bit more about um, different styles of hearing aids a little bit later. Once you get into the severe, actually moderately severe, um, severe and profound range, um, 
sometimes hearing aids work, but typically you're going to have to do something more. It might take a cochlear implant at that point um, in order to be able to have usable hearing um, with that. And we're not going to go too much into cochlear implants today, um, but if you do have questions about that, I can certainly provide a resource um, and connect you with an individual that can answer questions about that. All right, so I wanted to give a demonstration of what, it, what does this hearing loss sound like? Um, so hopefully you have your volume at a, at a comfortable level on your computer. Um, and I'm going to play this. And essentially what this is gonna do is gonna go through, um, what, is it, what does that sound like when you have different degrees of hearing loss? I know I'm young, could be a little bit wise about Um, so hopefully that gave you an idea um, of what hearing loss sounds like to others. Of course, if you're experiencing hearing loss, it probably sounded a lot different to you already. Um, so you can tell though that once that, that hearing loss progresses um, to one of those higher levels, um, it's very difficult, right, to hear that information. Um, and not always does the hearing loss affect all the frequencies at the same time you might only have hearing loss in those higher pitches. And so you hear fairly well on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, but then when you get in a group, or as I mentioned in background noise, then it becomes very difficult um, to hear in those dif difficult listening situations. So another example of this would be, we can compare it to visual, right? So um, this is an interactive part of the presentation. Anyone know who this, this picture is? It looks like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> when I present this to my students, um, you know, they have absolutely no clue. Um, but I knew they. I I feel like when you, when we have experience, right, with that, <laughs> you knew. So this actually is a it's an interesting point as well. But you are very right. Um, it, oops, I'm going the wrong way. It is Abraham Lincoln, but. Um, you can tell here that visually, you know, if we have a little more details and you have more details, there you can see them, right? Um, but Shana, why did you know? Why did you know that was Abraham Lincoln? Um, uh, <laughs> I think, well, first of all, we do a class on presidents and um, first wives. And, and so okay. we, we see those pictures all the time. But um, I, I just think the shadow over on the, the side there with the beard and all, I think. Um, just an old lady, and so I already know, <laughs> seen a couple of things. <laughs> well, you're an experienced lady, and you had oh. the experience with this picture before. Uh -huh. So that's another thing with hearing. So even as we're losing our hearing, if we have that experience with that information before, um, if you meet your neighbor every day as you're going for a walk and you always talk about grandchildren, you know that's coming and you have that information that you've talked about before. And so you can fill in sometimes those missing pieces that you might not catch all of those that information. Um, but then of course, as it gets clearer and clearer, then you're gonna hear it better. Um, so that's one of the things that we, we do have um, as we are experiencing life. We have that, that past experience that can help us when we're understanding speech and communication, um, but we have to work a little bit harder, right? Um, if, if, if 
we don't have that full uh, message. It takes us a little bit more thinking time um, to, to fill in those pieces and, and makes our brain work. But good job. Um, most of my students cannot guess who that is because they don't have that experience. And the other thing with Abraham Lincoln is there's not very many pictures of him. So this is a pretty common picture that we see of this individual. All right, so presbycusis. Um, so hearing as we age, no, we're not talking about Presbyterians. Don't anybody get excited, um, but we're gonna talk about presbycusis. So what that is, is it's just a fancy way to say a decline in our hearing as we age. Uh, it's one of the most common conditions that affects um, individuals um, as they are experiencing life. It actually affects one in three individuals. Um, so at between the ages of 65 and 74, at least a third of those individuals are experiencing some degree of hearing loss. And then beyond that, um, once you reach that age of 75, half the individuals are experiencing some degree of hearing loss. Um, so if you are experiencing hearing loss, I promise you, you are not alone. So that tells you like how many people are experiencing at those ages, but when does it start? Um, when does hearing loss um, essentially start to be a problem? Is it not till we're 75 um, or is it start sooner? So the um, CDC, uh, the Center um, of Disease Control, have done several studies looking at, um, you know, when does this become a problem um, and when do we need to start uh, addressing it, essentially. And actually, hearing loss starts a lot sooner than um, when people start coming in to um, indicating that something's wrong. Um, so as you can see here in this um, graph, the majority of hearing loss actually sets in between 20 years of age and 59 years of age. Um, more so for men, so the blue line is indicating the males, um, the yellow is indicating females. Um, so more so it, happen, uh, it starts earlier for men. That's usually tied to, um, to work. Maybe they work in a, in a louder environment um, or recreation. Uh, they might uh, choose hobbies that are a little bit louder, woodworking, um, shooting, um, right, guns, those kind of things. So, um, but, uh, but don't worry, the, the women catch up, right? Um, so we still experience hearing loss as well. Um, it's just a little bit, um, we push back just a little bit more. So this graph, I really kind of, if nothing else, I want you to think about this and the fact that if you are experiencing hearing loss um, and Tally's gonna reiterate this, don't wait. Um, to, to have that addressed. Um, and even if you think, gosh, maybe I'm not hearing as good as I, as I was previously, um, head into an audiologist and at least get a baseline testing done. Um, so you know that, well, yeah, okay, I'm doing pretty good and I don't need hearing aids yet or, or any kind of amplification. But then in five years or so, or 10 years, um, you have something to compare it back to and say, oh gosh, yeah, look at how much this has changed. I really need to do something um, about this. Um, the other part of this, so not only age um, is, our, is our enemy, um, but noise is our enemy too. I mentioned this a little bit with um, working and, and choosing hobbies, um, but when you are exposed to noise, that can increase that hearing loss. It, it actually speeds it up um, as we're aging. And so this graph, I'm actually going to start on the, the graph over here on the right. Um, this is plot, you know, the hearing levels plotted on that audiogram that I indicated. Um, so these first ones here, this is an indication of, of what normal hearing should be. We've got some circles here, we have X's, that's an indication for the ears. So the circles are the right ear, the X's are the left ear. Um, with hearing, with noise exposure, this is a typical hearing loss that we see with noise exposure. So it doesn't affect the, the low pitch sounds very much but it affects the mid frequencies, the mid pitches. And unfortunately that is right where speech is occurring. Um, and so if you are exposed to loud noises and that affects your hearing, it's, you're gonna have difficulties hearing speech and communicating with others. Um, so if you do have a loud hobby or you work somewhere loud, wear earplugs to protect the hearing that you have left. Um, over on the left, this is an indication of, of how loud things are. Um, so I like to start actually right here in the middle. So typical conversation, 
um, is around 60 dB. Um, so up here, right? Um, pretty good level. Um, so we can hear nice and clearly if we are talking in a, in a normal voice and we have normal hearing. But if you have a hearing loss and normal conversation is at 60, again, you might hear the, the, that somebody is talking, but you don't understand exactly what they're saying. Um, as you can see here, some of the, the louder sounds, right? We've got motorcycle, chainsaw, um, sirens, airplanes. So if anybody has a military background, if you're exposed to, um, you know, machines and um, aircrafts, um, any kind of explosion, it can definitely affect your hearing. Gabe, allow me to interrupt you for a moment, just to, to add something to that. So it's very important to say that the scale that we see here, uh, how loud is, is the sound, is in another scale, is a different scale from the audiogram. So when we say 60 dB for speech conversation, it basically means much lower dB in hearing level. So for example, a person that has this kind of hearing loss may lo lose a lot of information in, in, in normal conversation uh, loudness. So um, this is what I wanted to say. You don't need to wait to have a moderately severe hearing loss in order to ask for help or for, yeah. This is what I want to sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to wait till you have difficulties understanding um, before you seek help. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Here we go. All right. So noises um, plus age, they happen all the time, right? Um, so at work. Um, if you go to concerts or um, if you enjoy listening to the orchestra, um, you can still experience hearing loss if, it's, if it gets too loud. Um, if you listen to music in your house or um, in headphones, just don't turn it up too loud. I always tell my, um, my students, if you're listening to your headphones and um, the individual next to you, if you reach out your arm and touch their shoulder and if they can hear the headphones, it's too loud. You need to turn it down. Um, Going to sports events, right? That's a very loud um, environment. Um, I put I, Boise State's in here. I almost put Nebraska Cornhuskers, but I figured I would tail, tailor it to the audience. Um, <laughs> I At work, sometimes even just a desk job or I, not just, um, so it, it doesn't have to be just in a manufacturing plant that you're exposed to that noise. It could be other places too. Um, that you are being exposed to noise. Um, so all of these things uh, can add to just the experience um, of aging, right? Um, so we just need to be aware of those things. And if you know that you are going to be in noise, protect your hearing. So some common signs of presbycusis is, I probably mentioned most of these already, but um, misunderstanding. You hear that they're talking, you know they're saying something, but you're just not sure exactly what the message is. Um, lots of issues with noisy background. I mentioned the, the restaurant, um, sometimes even shopping. Uh, you'll be going down the aisle and you might, and somebody's talking to you, but there's music overhead, there's you know people putting things on the shelves and you can't understand it because of that noisy background. You can't hear high pitched sounds. So, um, we mentioned the, the audiogram with the low pitch sounds going up to the high pitch sounds. Usually the high pitch sounds are affected first. Um, so if you're talking to, to a male who has maybe a lower voice, you don't have any troubles hearing him, but perhaps you're talking to a female and they have a higher pitched voice or a, a child and they're difficult to understand. That's because their voice is higher. And so that's going to be a little bit more difficult um, to understand because that might be where you're, you're experiencing hearing loss. Ringing in the ear or in the head, if you hear that ringing or a static or a cricket sounds, um, that's referred to as tinnitus or tinnitus. Um, you can say it either way. It's in the dictionary both ways. Um, I usually go with tinnitus. Um, that's how I was taught. Uh, but that ringing in the ear is actually an indication that something, there's a problem in the, the auditory pathway um, somewhere that has caused damage and that ringing is a product of that damage. There are still lots of theories out there. We don't really have a specific, this is what's causing that tinnitus. 
Um, but uh, we know it exists and it does exist. People experience that. Um, and we do have some uh, remedy or uh, therapies and um, rehabilitation that can um, focus on reducing that, that perception of the tinnitus. There is no cure for tinnitus, unfortunately, but there are things we can do to reduce um, reactions to the tinnitus and also reduce the perception of the tinnitus. Um, and I have a list or a, a website I can direct you guys to later um, that has some good um, applications that you can get on your phone uh, for tinnitus. And then um, also mindfulness um, is one of the, the newer, well, it's not a new technique, but it, um, it's being applied to tinnitus rehabilitation. So um, I can give you a, a good um, application for that too. Um, if you have to ask individuals to repeat themselves often, um, if your favorite word is what, um, you might be experiencing some hearing loss, right? Uh, so um, if you find yourself doing that, it might be time to go in, um, or it's probably beyond time to go in to an audiologist and have your hearing checked. If you're having to turn up the, the TV or the radio and individuals are saying, hey, it's really loud, um, that's an indication that you have some presbycusis going on and then difficulties on the telephone as well. And then the last one, speaking loudly. Um, I get accused of this all the time, but I feel like that's my professor voice coming out or my audiology voice, I'm not sure. Uh, but um, if you feel like you have to speak up, um, that's also an indication that you might be experiencing some hearing loss as well. Tally, I think I was gonna mention something else on this slide and I've already forgotten what it was. Did I, did I get it? Was it the applications maybe? I think it was. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that untreated hearing loss. Um, what, what can happen if we ignore it and say, I'm fine, you just need to speak up a little bit, um, or you're talking too fast, I can't understand you because you're talking too fast. Um, there was a study that was done, there's actually been several studies. Um, this is the one of the more recent ones. Um, it was published in today's um, Geriatric Medicine Journal. And um, these were all the things that were found to correlate um, and to be potential um, risks of having untreated hearing loss. Um, so I'm not gonna read through them all. Um, you can hopefully read them, hopefully they're not too small on your screen. Um, but the one big thing is if you are experiencing hearing loss and it's more difficult to have conversations, like I don't wanna to go to coffee anymore with my friends because I can't understand what they're saying anyway, so I'll just stay home. So then you stay home and you aren't active. Um, when that happens, that social isolation, that can lead to depression and that can lead to other things. So um, that, that hearing loss, the untreated hearing loss has been found to be that, that root cause, right? That problem of these other things potentially occurring. Uh, and the one thing that we're gonna talk about more is this connection to dementia um, and how that um, research has found untreated hearing loss has been um, correlated with dementia. So I will pass it over to Tally now. Thank you again, Gabe, for this uh, honor to take a part in this so important presentation and topic. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very, I hope, hopefully you will uh, manage with my accent and I will explain myself good enough. So as Gabe told you, uh, there is an interconnectedness between hearing loss and dementia. And indeed, there is a growth interest in the literature and in our field in this relationship between hearing loss and uh, dementia or cognitive decline. And there are a few research, basically they are observational or more longitudinal research uh, that look uh, after follow up uh, um, in a very large cohort of people uh, along a, a long, a long a period of time. And what they show basically is that hearing loss is one of the most significant factors that can increase the chances for dementia above all the other factors that are already known to be connected to dementia, like uh, aging, smoking, diabetes, et cetera. And we are talking about dementia, but I think we should define it first because we, most of us, we are not familiar with this term. 
So what is dementia? First, it's, it's a progressive global impairment in many areas of cognitive uh, abilities, like thinking, understanding, learning, and remembering. And according to the DSM-5, which is the, um, the, the American uh, manual for uh, defining the, the mental disabilities, uh, diagnosis of, uh, of dementia is a three-step process. The first one, the patient or is it a family member or somebody who is uh, close to this person must report significant cognitive decline. It means that it's something that is quite noticeable. It's not something that occurs just once in a while, okay? The second step is that the patient must score significant low on test of dementia. And there are many of them and there are also um, tests for screening dementia in a, in, you know, in a clinic. Uh, in, we are using that in research and in clinic as well. And also, uh, we need to conduct a complete medical workup in order to rule out other conditions like depression and delir delirium that might look like dementia, but they are not dementia indeed. So this condition, for example, can be treated medically by medications or by therapy, while dementia is not, it can be treated by medications, for example. And another thing that we should mention in this context is that dementia involves some combinations of cognitive deficits in, in some areas. It's not just to, it's like a multidisciplinary uh, dysfunction and it affects language abilities, fine motor skills, memory, and executive function. And by saying executive function, I mean uh, abilities like planning, organizing, sequencing, and abstracting thinking. These, these are abilities that are uh, taking part into, uh, in our frontal lobe, in our frontal brain, okay? Now we can say that hearing loss and dementia have a common characteristics. First, uh, both of them, there are clinical presentations of a disease or dysfunction. Uh, when we say that the, the hearing loss occurs mainly in the auditory pathways and uh, dementia occurs in the brain pathways, but basically it's quite difficult to distinguish between both of them because as, as, as Gabe mentioned before, when we try to listen in a very challenging uh, listening converse, uh, uh, situation, we need both of them. We need hearing and we need cognition as well. Uh, we can distinguish between them. So basically when somebody has a dementia, we don't know if it occurs because he has a hearing loss or just because he has deficits in his cognitive abilities. Um, and, both of them, unfortunately, they start and progress very slowly. So sometimes it's quite difficult to notice the difference, to notice that something is going on there and uh, to notice the dysfunction. Uh, and what is very important to mention in this context is that there is a relationship, Gay, okay, please press the button, yes. So there is a relationship between uh, dementia or the, the chances for dementia and the degree of hearing loss. Uh, there is a, a study of uh, 783 people that were, was conducted in the US and showed very interesting findings. Uh, what it shows that in mild hearing loss, a, a person has two times more chances to develop dementia if we compare it to someone with normal hearing. Now, if a person has a moderate hearing loss, now we have a three times more chances to develop dementia. And pay attention to that. If you have a severe hearing loss, you have five times more chances to develop dementia comparing to, hear, to someone who is a, has a normal hearing. So it means that if we catch it or we uh, take care of the hearing loss as soon as possible, not when it becoming, when it becomes severe hearing loss, we can maybe um, prevent the deterioration of the, of the cognition. Uh, so this is something that also Gabe mentioned, and I, I agree with her. Now, trying to explain this uh, relationship between hearing loss and dementia, investigators came up with uh, about four theories that try to explain that. So the first one uh, is talking about uh, a mediation effect between hearing impairment and cognitive decline by cognitive load. 
And what is cognitive load? It means that when somebody find it difficult to hear in specific situations, so there is much, much more listening effort, more attention that is, is being required or more memory. And this cognitive load, this is what causes the cognitive decline. Another thing that we already talked about is that uh, both of them are a, a, a changes in, in brain pathways. You can call it auditory or you can call it brain, but, but basically are, they are the same because everything happens in the brain. So maybe because of the, of the decline in the auditory pathway, we can see only, only dec also declines in other brain pathways as well. The third theory talks about that, that hearing impairment causes, as, as Gabe mentioned, social isolation. Okay, somebody will find it difficult or struggle to hear uh, in, in, uh, in normal hearing situation, like in a restaurant or in a social engagement. So most of the time you, you, you would say, okay, I will stay at home. I will isolate myself from this situation and then I won't be embarrassed by, the, by this, uh, uh, these situations. So being social isolated can lead to depression and we know that depression and social isolation are, are, are one of the most significant factors that can lead to cognitive decline above hearing impairment and the last one talks about maybe parallel pathways maybe hearing impairment and cognitive decline just share common etiology or a common risk factors that cause both of them, like aging, diabetes, hypertension, microvascular disease, and, and so on. So it's not that something causes the other, but both of them just occur simultaneously. And this is just a small anecdote that they found in the, in the, in the internet about what causes what, what is the egg and what is the chicken here. Uh, so he says, okay, yeah, but what if I can't remember if I have a hearing loss? Okay, so I have a hearing loss, but I can remember that. So, okay, so this is just a, a small joke. Um, so what, does the, what do these results mean basically? It's very important to emphasize that. First, I want to emphasize that there is no evidence that hearing loss causes dementia. Okay, we are talking about correlational relationship and not causal relationship, okay? And, but we do know, okay, uh, that for individuals that age 65 and older, okay, that they are in the gold, in the gold age uh, and have hearing loss, they are more likely to acquire dementia. So it's very, very important to treat the hearing loss as soon as possible. Now, what about the connection between dementia and hearing aids? Okay, so first we need to, um, uh, to emphasize that there is no conclusive evidence uh, that suggests that hearing aids slow down cognitive decline. This is something that I have been asked a lot in the clinic when I worked in Israel as a clinical audiologist. Whether if I, if I wear hearing aids, it can assure me that they won't have any cognitive decline. So I can't, it, it, this is not evidence-based yet, okay? There are, uh, there are in the literature in our field few, a few longitudinal studies that try to examine that to explore this issue, but still we can't say that wearing hearing aids can prevent this cognitive decline. Um, but we do know that hearing aids do seem to improve the psychological behaviors and activity levels for individuals with hearing loss, and this is also a very important thing that the contribution of hearing aids and. Okay, uh, and that we, we because of that, because uh, the hearing aid can improve our uh, communication skills, we can be also more socially active, and, and this can improve our well being and our quality of life. And this is also something that is really important because we said before that when you are social uh, isolated and you have maybe depression, you, you have more risk to develop a, a cognitive decline as well. And we can say also that hearing aids, along with a, a healthy diet and a exercise and social engagement, are very important uh, to stay, uh, take a very important role in staying act, as active and as healthy as possible when people are aging. 
And this is very uh, nice citation that I liked from a psychiatry uh, a professor from Duke University that said that benefits, the benefits of correcting hearing loss on cognition are twice as large as the benefits of any cognitive enhancing drugs. And I, I found it very important to mention that because when you go to your physician and you're saying that you have maybe memory problems or uh, attention deficits or something like that, they immediately you know, prescribe you medications. Yeah, and they don't give you even the, the idea that you might have maybe a hearing loss and you just can wear hearing aids and that's it, that's the solution for the problem. So we can definitely say that when, when you have a health, healthy hearing, you have a healthy brain as well. So now we reach to the, to, the, the, to the solution, what we can do about it. And it's very important to talk about it because I know that hearing aids uh, has a lot of stigma uh, in the society. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about hearing aid styles, we, uh, we divide the, 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 the different products to two main categories or groups. We divide it into the in the ear hearing instruments, okay? And we can see that we have a few styles or a sizes of hearing aids. So we can see that there is a, what we call the completely in the canal instrument. Uh, by the way, all of them are uh, customized or built individually or personally for the customer. Uh, according to the ear structure uh, and uh, other, other factors that we are taking into consideration as well, like motor skills, fine motor skills or vision or things like that. Uh, so when we are talking about completely in the canal, we can see an instrument that is quite deep in the ear canal and barely seen uh, from the outside. But we have also a larger sizes of hearing aids, like the in the canal and the full shell that covers all the concha, all the pina from outside. And we also have the behind the ear hearing instruments that uh, are fitted behind, behind the ear. And uh, we can see that uh, there are also a few styles. And the most common and modern one, it's the receiver in the canal that uh, is very discreet, very aesthetic, because uh, the main part of the instrument, which are the, the microphones and the amplifier, are put in a very small case behind the ear. And the speaker is connected in, with a very, uh, very small and thin wire to the instrument and goes very deeply in the ear canal. So you can see in this figure that it's barely seen, that you can use hearing aid and nobody can notice that. This is amazing. I would like also to mention that hearing aids are not just personal amplifiers, they can connect you today with the modern technology by Bluetooth to almost everything that you can think about, okay? You can, you, you can be connected directly through the earring instruments to your, to your iPhone or to your smartphone, uh, to your smartwatch and all other devices like television and computer and uh, media players. So basically it can improve your hearing in all the or, or li or daily life situations that you can even think about. And in this context, I would also like to mention, even though these are not hearing aids, we will consider them as hearing aids, they are also important in uh, uh, the hearing rehabilitation for a few persons. For example, we have assistive hearing devices that are not designated to give amplification according to an audiogram, but still can be very helpful and uh, efficient for people that can can go through all this process of hearing aid fitting and stay mainly in you know, quiet environments and they are not struggling in a very noisy or very challenging hearing situations. So we have here like the headset for the television that can um, amplify the sound of the television and facilitate the hearing in, in this kind of a situation. We have the personal amplifier that can increase the volume of all the sounds that you can hear uh, in the environment. And we even have like a spe special telephones for hearing impaired that can translate speech to text or amplify the sound so you can hear much better uh, the telephone conversations. And I just wanted to add one thing I just thought about. Um, these telephones, uh, most audiologists 
can actually uh, get you those telephones for free if you do have a hearing loss. Um, there are different companies within the United States that will um, essentially provide those, um, that technology or the, the telephone for free um, once you have that documented hearing loss. So um, if that's something that you're interested in and you go see the audiologist, make sure to ask them about it. Yes, yeah, so it's nice that it's free because not it, not in every place in the world it's free. So, yes, uh, and I, I see that we have a question here, so I would like to just read it and answer it. Uh, Lisa is asking, is there a recommendation of a hearing aid for an older person that may have difficulty adjusting volumes? So yeah, today, I don't know if it, if it answers the question, but today most of the hearing aids is like a remote control, which is very easy to handle uh, by older uh, adults. And also we can have app in our smartphone that can also control the volume of the hearing instrument. So you don't need necessarily to push like a small button or just to, to uh, you know, change the wheel. Uh, so maybe it can help if it, if it uh, any, and also most of the instruments today are more adaptive to the environment. They can adjust the volume and the directionality to what's going on in the, in the environment automatically without doing anything, basically. So does it answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Because in, in reference to my mom, I know that she would have difficulty doing any kind of adjustments in her yes. ear. She doesn't have any smartphone type of thing or anything, you know, and she uh, that she knows how to operate anything like that or has it available to her. But uh, no, if I guess that would be the answer is one that would environmentally make the changes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes, and besides today, I um it's Today, the hearing aids are very sophisticated in that manner that we can give amplification, which is uh, designated to different input levels. Okay, so for example, if the instrument uh, detects uh, a low input level, it gives more amplification than if it's a high input level. So it automatically adjusts the, in, the, the gain or the amplification according to the input level. So most of the time, the customer doesn't need to touch the volume control. It's just, you know, like psychologically needed because we, we, we love to feel, a con, to have control on things, but most of the time you don't need to do that. And besides, as I said before, you don't have to have a smartphone in order to control the instrument. You can use a very simple remote control like you're using for the television, that you have volume up and volume down, and that's it. It's very easy to control by older adults from experience in telling you that. Yeah, she would probably be able to operate something like that. Yes, it's very, very common, very uh, uh, simple to use because they have large buttons in it. So it's very easy to press and to see it for people that have visual problems as well. So yeah, great, welcome. thank you. You're welcome. Um, and as you can see also, this, and this, this slide that we have also the option of personal amplifier, that it's not a hearing instrument, it's more uh, like, um, analog instrument that you can just turn a wheel up and down like in a radio and it's much easier for other adults to uh, operate so maybe it can help her as well so uh just to summarize sorry i was just going to add so that those personal amplifiers that we have a picture of here in the middle um they really are not they don't cost that much typically um, I used to tell people to go to Radio Shack, which Radio Shack doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but I, any place like that would have this type of personal amplification system. And it's, as Tally said, it's, it's analog. It's very basic. Um, the sound comes in and it's louder. Um, and you just turn up the volume to however loud you want it to, um, to be. Uh, but that is uh, sometimes a good option for individuals that maybe they're not ready for hearing aids or they, they feel like they can't afford hearing aids because there is a cost associated with hearing aids. Um, so this is, um, it can be an option sometimes. You can also find it very easily on Amazon or any, on the websites. And uh, I can tell you that in Israel, I used to sell uh, this kind of uh, amplifiers that is an American product that's called a pocket talker. 
it's it's even much it looks much modern than this one uh so it's very cheap comparing to hearing aids and this is something that can you can you can easily find on amazon if you want um so just to wrap up and you know to to summarize the things so i think that the the most important thing that you should take with you from this presentation uh, to your daily life is that it's if you have a sensation that something is going on with your hearing, go and check it. Okay, we have there, there are many websites today that offer like um, um, a hearing screening online that you can do or perform in your in your own computer or in your own uh, smartphone, and just get a notion, a very basic notion, if you have something going on there and to further investigate it in a hearing cleaning by an audiologist. And if something is going on there, if even if you have a mild hearing loss, take care of it because there are a very vast cons consequences of that and not only uh, in our communication abilities, but also as you can, as you can uh, understand now, also in our cognition and our, um, you know, more general quality of life, not only hearing people. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And if there are more questions, I would be more pleased, that, more than pleased to hear that and answer that. Oh yeah, Boca Toca. There are a few websites that I wanted to share with you um, until somebody has a question. So please ask your questions. Um, I'm just gonna, oh, Sh Shana, did you have one? Yes, um, actually, um, it's just a, um, a thing. It, it, can you put your cursor on the bottom left of, the, of your uh, PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Do little uh, icons come up? Okay. Uh -huh. And is one of those uh, three dots, if you go further, there you go. Um, click on that one. The one with the three dots, it's on the far yep. left. Let me get rid of my uh, laser pointer. Well, it's been. Uh, uh huh. That three dots, and then one. Does it say? Um, well, I don't see it here. I it. Um, um, we've accidentally discovered that um, in PowerPoint in um, uh, slideshow, there is a function that will um, type out whatever you're saying at the bottom of the screen. Oh. And we uh, seriously just fell on it. We were, we, somebody was doing something else and we saw these things and it, it's called um, um, like closed caption or something that you would normally uh, think of it. But uh, anyway, I, I will find out more about it and let you know because I think that you guys probably, probably could use that. Um, it was like, it was just like that three dots and one of the options was to um, um, start typing the words that I'm saying. And so the people who already had hearing loss would see it right down at the bottom. Yeah, that's a, I, I have not seen that on PowerPoint before. So I will have to uh, do some looking into that. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know, okay. The, the one thing that is cool, and I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, is that all TVs, and I can say that um, with enthusiasm, all TVs have closed captioning. Um, that's a requirement that has um, been, uh, passed by uh, the American Disabilities Act. So um, that's one thing that you can do uh, if, if somebody's complaining that you're uh, turning the TV up or somebody you know uh, is turning the TV up um, too much. If they can um, turn those captions on, that can help. Um, there's been lots of studies that have looked at visual information and hearing information. And if you can have both of those together, your comprehension or your understanding of information is much better when you have both. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, I see all you here. What questions do you have? You came for a reason. Did you get all your questions and, and thoughts answered? Well, one, one question that I have is, um, is it normal to have, um, my hearing is um, in one ear is uh, much worse than the other one. I don't know why. And, um, in fact, one of, I should probably have a hearing aid in the, the one ear. Um, when you, is it normal just to have a hearing aid in one ear or, or do you normally um, end up with both of them? And are there any 
um, any uh, challenges with just having one. Tally, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, this is a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so first, I always said to the patients that if you have symmetric hearing loss or asymmetric hearing loss, but both of them are with hearing loss, so you should wear two hearing aids, okay? It's because the sum of the bilateral hearing, okay, when we hear with both ears, it's not like adding one to one and you get two. It's more than that because the brain integrates the information that he receives from both ears. And it's really important for us to many abilities in the real world, like listening in noisy environments or uh, localizing sounds in the environment. You probably experience the, 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 the difficulty to localize sounds in the environment because of your asymmetric hearing loss, right? Mm -hmm. If the telephone is ringing, you, don't, you can't say, tell where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And this is because you don't have a symmetric uh, hearing in both ears. Mm -hmm. So if you have one, one ear with hearing loss, you should wear one hearing aid. But if you have both them impaired, so you should wear both hearing aids, definitely. Great. Yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I can see that Gabe is, uh, is giving the information regarding the websites for mindfulness and, uh, uh, and also the, the screening tests for hearing. There are many, plenty of them. Just, you know, Google uh, screening online hearing tests and you find many of them. Uh, it's really important. And, and yeah, now I think the access that we get specifically during the, the last year of the pandemic, that we all moved to online. So the access that we get to hearing aids, to, uh, I don't know, hearing tests via uh, the, the web, it's much larger. So we can enjoy that. Uh, so maybe this is one advantage that we uh, we have from this, all this terrible uh, period of time that we had or experienced during the last year. Um, but yeah, the, the field is going to this, to this, um, the, this is the trend, okay? We are going to the online. So mm -hmm. you can look for that and find many things online, even hearing aids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one other question I had was um, the hairs um, the, that you were talking about. So they just get old. <laughs> they just they just get tired, or what? What happens? Is it? And is there anything to? Pre is that more genetic, or is there anything to prevent that? But that, yeah, that's the. Yeah, do you want me to take this one, Tally? And, and uh, I can say that everything she said is correct. Right. Uh, it's everything. Yeah, it's genetics yeah. and it's tired and everything is, is going on there. It's not just one thing. And as also as Gabe mentions, it's the noise, in, no, noise induced, um, um, the noise that induced the, 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 the problem as well. But it's not, you can, you know, distinguish between the causes because everything together, this is what makes it, makes it uh, impaired, basically. Okay. And, and I'll talk about that genetic part of it. Um, there's been lots of studies done to try to figure out, okay, who is going to develop hearing loss? You know, because your grandma had hearing loss, are you going to get hearing loss? And they have found some connections, but there's nothing just, you know, super solid um, that we can hang our hat on that says, oh yeah, your family has weak ears, you're going to have hearing loss, or your family has strong ears. Um, it's, it's more to do with what are you exposed to in the environment? Those kind of things. So those hair cells. So I'm not sure who named them. They, they made it very confusing for the rest of us because they're really not hair cells. Um, what happens is on top of, so let's say my palm is the, the cell. Um, on top of that, there are little cilia that are on top of it. And so that's why they call them hair cells. But essentially as that, the sound is being pushed into the cochlea, there's, there's fluid that is moving those cilia. And as they move, that's what causes that stimulation, that, that energy to go down the cilia into the cell um, for hearing. And then it passes that information on to the neural activity, so, or to the neural pathway. Um, so the problem is those little cilia, um, if they get bent or damaged, or if there's a really you know, loud noise and they get hit a lot because of that loud noise, 
then they start deteriorating. Uh, and then even if that fluid is still there, those cilia aren't there uh, to move. And so that's what causes that permanent hearing loss. And there, there are some studies out there right now that are looking at regrowing those cells. Mm -hmm. um, so regrowing those hair cells. And they are positive in birds. Um, so chickens, we can regrow those hair cells in chickens and in some other um, aviation um, animals, um, but not in humans yet. They mm -hmm. are, they're still working on it. Um, they're using some of the like stem cells and those other things to try to recreate that in humans. And it's, um, there, there are some positive findings, um, but not enough yet um, mm -hmm. to, to say that, yes, this really is going to work. So okay. they're ongoing. Great. Great. There is a question I gave, what kind of specialist should I start with if experiencing hearing loss? Yeah, great so, question, Ron. Great question. Mm -hmm. You want to answer it? Go for it. Oh, well, I don't know if there is a like policies here in the States. In Israel, we would start with the ear, nose, and throat physician with the EMT that can examine the ear canal and see whether there is an indication for a like ear wax that was uh, blocking in, in the ear canal or something medically that can be treated. Uh, and then if everything is fine and there is no evidence for a conductive component, so it would send you to a hearing test in a clinical, in, in a hearing clinic, and then you can perform the hearing test. Yeah. Uh, it's the same here? Uh, it's similar. It, it, it's some, yeah. it, it depends on, um, I would say insurance is going to oh. be one of those big things that's going to tell you which way to go. Because sometimes you have to have that referral from the medical provider um, in order to go to a specialist. Um, and then sometimes you don't. So the best thing to do would be to call the clinic that you're going to go to and see, do I need a referral um, or do can I just come in and make an appointment? Um, as far as the specialist um, regarding hearing, I would strongly suggest going to an audiologist at first. Um, so we do have hearing aid dispensers um, in the United States. Um, I, they're sometimes referred to as hearing instrument specialists. Um, sometimes they're called hearing aid dealers, um, it, different terms. And um, the difference between a hearing aid dispenser and an audiologist is eight years of schooling. So a hearing aid dispenser, um, they can get a license to dispense a hearing aid in about six months. They are trained um, about you know, what the ear is and how it works, pretty much what I just told you guys. And then they take a test. And then they would learn about a hearing aid and they would take a test and then they'd learn how to fit that hearing aid and take a test on that. And then they're good to go. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are some fantastic um, hearing aid dispensers and hearing instrument specialists out there because they've been doing it for a long time. They know what they're doing. They know their product, um, but they, their limit is they are, they know that hearing aid um, and they know how to fit that. An audiologist has to have a bachelor's degree and then they, um, some people have a master's degree. So for instance, Tally and I have master's degrees. Um, now, if you would go to school in the United States, you're going to get a clinical doctorate. So they don't even have a master's level anymore. It goes right to a doctoral degree. Um, so they will have at least um, eight years of school to learn about the auditory system, what things can go wrong, um, then, what can we do to, to help that um, when we do find that, that, that problem that's causing it? Um, audiologists are going to look more at the whole individual. Um, what's potentially causing that hearing loss? Could it be connected with something else? Um, there are a lot of um, conditions out there that hearing loss is the first thing that we might see. Um, and we, we diagnose that hearing loss and then we say, you know what, you need to head back to your primary care physician and have a full workup. And with the knowledge of you have a hearing loss, is there something connected to that? Um, is it a heart condition? Uh, is it an undiagnosed heart condition that could be connected with that hearing loss? So audiologists are gonna learn the, the more of the, the why is that hearing loss happening and get to the, the cause of why it's happening. So my strong advice would be to go to an audiologist at least for that diagnostic part of it um, and understanding what's going on with your hearing. Um, 
a lot of people will choose to go to the hearing instrument specialist because of cost. They think it's gonna cost less to get that hearing aid from that individual. And uh, on the, the surface, yeah, it might, it might look that way. Um, however, a lot of those individuals, you are only buying that hearing aid and then they wave goodbye and they don't provide anything else to go along with that hearing aid. Um, the audiologists, most clinics, I know at least everybody here in the Treasure Valley, um, audiologists, if you buy a hearing aid from them, you are, they will take care of you for the life of that hearing aid, essentially, or for the warranty of that hearing aid. Um, most hearing aids come with a um, three-year warranty, um, and then they also have packages that you can buy um, extended warranties on those as well. Um, but essentially, every time something goes wrong um, with that hearing aid, you can come in and you don't have to pay for an office visit. Um, they're going to take care of that hearing aid and take care of you. They want you to come in. Um, they want you to come in every six months just to check to see how it's going, um, to see if your hearing has changed, those kind of things. So, um, so if you are shopping for a hearing aid, um, don't just look at the price point of the hearing aid. Also find out what comes with it, um, that because that needs to be in your decision making. And I can tell you this because I don't sell hearing aids, so I don't have a bias to anyway, and I'm not trying to sell you a hearing aid. I just know what comes behind it um, when you're purchasing that hearing aid. I would like to add something to what you mentioned that we are looking at the person as a whole. This is a very important point because when we fit hearing aids to a person, we don't look only on the audiogram on the ears. We are looking at all the person at all the abilities. And sometimes it, it, enjoying hearing aids, it's not straightforward. It means that it's not just wearing a hearing aid and then you can hear perfectly like a normal hearer. Uh, sometimes we need training. We need to train the brain, to train the auditory system, how to hear this well with this hearing instrument, because it's a new sound. It's a new uh, stimulus to the ear and to the brain. So it's something that we also need to take into consideration that when you're going to a clinic, to a hearing clinic, they, they look at all the picture and not just, you know, how what is the degree of the hearing loss? Let's fit hearing aids and that's it. So this is very important point as well to mention. I was not muted. I see that there is a question from Wendy about um, increased falls uh, for Alzheimer's uh, patients. We are not planning on talking about too much about vestibular today, um, but uh, I can say that that is correct. Um, so when, I can go back on the slide here. I think it's here somewhere. So our balance system, um, also called the vestibular system, is connected with the hearing system. So sometimes when you have that hearing loss, your vestibular system can be affected as well. Sorry, of course, it's like the first slide. It is the first slide. There we go. Um, so right here, you can see the um, that cochlea, right? That inner ear portion. And then we can't see it very well because of the angle of this, but connected to that is this area. It's called the semicircular canals. And that's your vestibular um, sensory, right? Um, there's also some other areas here um, referred to as the, um, the saccule and the utricle. Um, but those, all, those things together are your vestibular system. And absolutely, when those things are affected, when your hearing is affected, um, you are going to have an increase um, for falls. And actually, um, falling uh, is one of the, I, I think it's the highest um, risk for developing other problems, right? Because we all know that when you fall, it's not just oops and getting back up. Uh, a lot of times you damage more things on your way down or when you land. Um, so I can't speak a whole lot to the, the vestibular system, Wendy. Um, that is definitely not one of my specialties. That's another thing that um, audiologists, even though it's a very small part of our body, um, we have specialties. And so um, there are audiologists that their specialty is vestibular. And so when uh, you have a balance issue, um, you would call the, the audiologist and make an appointment just for that testing of vestibular system. So, um, but I can certainly give you a um, resource uh, to, to learn more about that if you would like to. Because I know I can this is also why, why many times when we have hearing loss, it's accompanied by dizziness or vertigo or you know, balance issues because there is a connection 
very uh, very close connection between the, the, the vestibular system and the, and the hearing system in the, you know, in the inner ear. So, yeah. Are there any more questions? Well, we certainly want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. It, it's been a delight and very informative. Um, also, as I said before, there will not be um, an evaluation to fill out, but I'd like to encourage anyone who has a skill that they would like to present in an AARP presentation uh, to either contact the office or there is a website uh, and it's pretty easy to remember. It's um, if you just uh, go to AARPID, meaning Idaho, at aarp.org and uh, that way you can let them know that you're interested in giving us more information on something, a uh, particular skill that you have. Again, we thank the presenters. You've been wonderful and we appreciate, uh, particularly um, as we're nearing or in that time <laughs> of hearing loss, uh, the information. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Sheena and um, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, I know that uh, Gabe and Talia would, um, if you have some more questions that come up, please um, send them send them back to me and I can get it to them uh, easily. It's no, no problem at all. We sure do appreciate your attention here. And thanks for the information. We appreciate it. Yes, thanks for Thank having me. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Very welcome.